You know, one of the things I just love about Christianity is being able to relate to the stories of Jesus and the Gospels. And today's story uh, is one that I can relate to. How many of us have felt like a stranger in a very familiar place? A stranger in a familiar place, you know, a place that we can usually expect fairly predictable routines and responses, kind of like our home or even like um, our church. But if you've gone through a major shift in your life while you were away, instead of a welcoming embrace, we can often find that our homecoming becomes kind of traumatic and we're treated with kind of a suspicion or distrust. And that's exactly what took place in the story that we read about from Mark's gospel as Jesus returns to his home synagogue in Nazareth. Now, if you look at the gospel, it's been a relatively short period of time since Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River and then spent some time in the wilderness sorting things out before he launched his ministry. He's been through a major life shift. He was no longer practicing as a carpenter as he had once been. Instead, he'd been functioning as a prophet. He'd been traveling around, gathering a few disciples and showing the people of Israel that the kingdom of God was in their midst. He was casting out demons, healing people, and even bringing back to life the young girl from last week's lesson. And he was preaching unorthodox things that challenged Jewish traditional teaching. So this recently born prophet, Jesus, arrives back at his home synagogue, not to applause at his accomplishments, or even a willingness to listen to his teaching, Instead, Jesus's life shift was upsetting to the people in the synagogue, and it set them off to question, where did Jesus get all this? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and, not her, are, and are not his sisters here with us? Jesus had a big family. <laughs> Jesus was a stranger in this familiar place. And he responded to the synagogue's lack of his acceptance with those famous words, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And then Mark goes on to note, and he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Have you ever been amazed at people's unbelief? You know, you've discovered something that's wonderful and life-changing. You come and you express it to them and they look at you like you have three heads. Was there ever a coming to terms with this difference between Jesus and his home synagogue? Well, there's no evidence of that in the Gospels at all. And I know there have been many people that have had kind of similar experiences. When I worked in Skokie, Illinois, there was a woman from a devout Jewish home who converted to Christianity. And she told me her story of arriving at her home uh, for Hanukkah and being totally ostracized. She felt like she had to choose between her faith and her family and her whole culture she was brought up in. I've talked with gay people who have had some very rocky homecomings when they came out as well. They found themselves as a stranger in a most familiar place. I've even worked with veterans who served tours in Vietnam and when they returned in country, it seemed like a foreign place to them. You're treated differently. Those who were once your friends treated you with distrust and suspicion. I think this is also an issue today as we have lots of people who look at our country, the one they grew up in, and they feel like a stranger in a very familiar place. 
something to think about on this 4th of July. Now, I have to ask, if this Jesus that we meet in today's gospel story, is he a stranger in our own church and in our own minds? You know, the Jesus we talk about with whom we share communion had brothers and sisters. He wasn't born of the ever Virgin Mary and was a single child. I'm sure we have a few people who say, well, I don't ever remember the scripture saying that before. Is this a new edition? It's like I'm reading it again for the first time. And I think that's a hint as to how we can reconcile the situation when you have a person who feels like a stranger in a familiar setting. The first step seems to be always an honest conversation, an honest conversation where both parties are listening. It's like how we show hospitality to strangers. What do we do? We have a conversation when we meet them. We listen to who they are and where they're from, and we share our information as well. So the next time we see them, they're no longer strangers at all. We read in Deuteronomy 10 this morning about not forgetting where we came from because we were all strangers at one time or another. We've all been strangers, haven't we? Knowing We know that feeling of uncertainty of whether we're going to be accepted or even if we're going to be accepted. You know, it's very challenging to lay aside your own assumptions and your own thoughts about the way things, you expect things to be, and then listen openly. It's a lot harder to set aside what we always believed and depended upon to start off in a new direction. That is so difficult to do, which I think the synagogue in Nazareth is a glaring example. One of the things that's amazing to me is that you would have people like the disciples of Jesus who would be willing to live like Jesus did. As Jesus sends them out two by two to confront evil and to heal the sick and to bring good news to people who are already pretty well entrenched in their established ways of thinking, to know that there are people who can be willing to live like that, to me is just an amazing, an amazing thing. And I'm always struck that when Jesus sends these disciples out, he sends them out with no security, no food, no bag, no money in their belts, no extra tunic. Those are kind of basically uh, basic things that you have for security when you travel in the ancient world. Instead, they are completely dependent upon the hospitality of the people whom they encountered and who they worked with. That, to me, is just absolutely stunning. That's living a life of faith, isn't it? Not knowing what the next day will bring, not knowing where we'll end up, not knowing how we will be greeted. Then you have to truly depend on God and not yourself or your own wealth or your own abilities. I think there are a few people who seem to find that challenging, really rewarding and exciting. I think of people like Bruce Parmalee, who comes instantly to mind. <laughs> but I think there's probably a great many of us that look at that and just think it's absolutely amazing that people can live with that kind of faith. Perhaps on this particular Sunday, I'm going to take some time and try to think about the fact of if in fact I can live with that kind of faith. And if I can't, perhaps I need to figure out why not. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.